Good afternoon, everyone. Lisa told you about all the great things we're doing at AMD to bring new, innovative products to market, culminating in the Kaveri APU shipping at the end of this year. At the AMD Developer Summit, I always talk to you, the programmer, <coughs> the software developer. So now we'll get into the details of how you program these devices, how you get to benefit from those HSA features in the Kaveri APU and in a, a wealth of APUs to come. At previous developer summits, I focused on explaining the HSA architecture and how it enables workloads on the client. Today, I want to take a different focus and, and look at the server and how your workloads, your applications can scale to the cloud. And more importantly, how they can do it easily in the languages you already choose to use. Modern cloud workloads are already heterogeneous. That means they have scalar content and parallel content. And the parallel content is growing, and it's only going to grow still further. Video is already an enormous component of the internet traffic and expected to represent two-thirds of mobile data traffic by 2017. This means video is constantly being captured, processed, uploaded, transcoded, it has its format and image quality enhanced, and then it's recompressed and streamed. This is inherently a parallel process, and it can be accelerated. It will be accelerated. Big data is growing exponentially. Exabytes of data crawled monthly. Indexing the web and extracting high-definition content and information from that big data is a parallel workload. Heterogeneous workload, MapReduce is itself a heterogeneous workload. The map portion is, is incredibly parallel. Even the reduction operations have scope for parallel acceleration. And natural user interfaces are still in their infancy. And by that, I mean we're going to go from large arm gestures to fingertip controls in front of the glass or way off of the glass. And the processing of those natural user interfaces whether they are gesture, face recognition, mood recognition, uh, voice and tone inflection, sometimes going to be done on the client, but very often done on the cloud. So as more of these workloads get accelerated in the cloud, naturally there's a need to simultaneously increase the performance for a better user experience and reduce the power, get the total cost of ownership of the data centers down, and of course, get us to thinner, lighter, cooler form factors in the devices we carry and use. Future technology growth is going to further accelerate this trend. We see a rapid growth of sensor networks, both in our environment and in terms of wearable devices. People refer to this as the Internet of Things going to the Internet of Everything. What it definitely means is an explosion in data, both locally and especially in the cloud. We've talked a lot about surround computing, <coughs> processing all of the data from the sensors and extract extracting meaning to present to the user and anticipate their needs. Context-aware computing is a similar phenomenon, and it's a huge big data problem, <coughs> and we will need the acceleration again, both in our clients and in the cloud. HSA-enabled APU processors operate harmoniously at low power. And a good example of this is video processing. There are a lot of techniques in video processing that require acceleration. Image stabilization from uh, shaky handheld uh, camera recordings, super resolution, lots of different image enhancement techniques all the way to lighting and contrast. And these enhancements typically take data from multiple frames temporarily in, in different video frames and combine them to produce a better image. Clearly, that's a, that's a lot of parallel processing. And the algorithms can be run on multiple processors in the APU, not just the CPU and the GPU, but DSPs and fixed function accelerators. 
The key to accelerating these workloads and doing it in a power efficient manner is to let the processing flow freely between the processes and operate in data on data in place. So this leads to the concept of heterogeneous processes everywhere. APUs, SOCs, started in notebooks and phones. They're now in tablets and workstations. They're going to the dense server and the supercomputer because the workloads are there to benefit from them. And that gives you a single scalable architecture for the world's programmers. That's demanded at this point because as people write their algorithms and applications, they want them to scale out to the different machines. So how does HSA as an overall architecture make this work? It's simple. It enables acceleration of the languages that programmers already use. Java, C++, Python, and many others to come. All processors will use the same address space. They can share data structures in place, and pointers can flow from one processor to another. Heterogeneous computing can use all of the memory. This means both all of the physical memory on the machine and all of the virtual address space in each processor. Very different to the legacy systems that combine the accelerators to just a small fragment of the available system memory. We extended multi-core coherency to the GPU, and HSA will also take it to other processes. This is key because it allows the applications, the software, to focus on their algorithms and not on the details of memory management or cache coherency. It made sense for multi-core and SMP CPUs. It makes sense for all of the other heterogeneous processes. We enable passing work quickly between the processes. That's what HQ, a heterogeneous queuing, is all about. Allowing the processes to communicate to each other through queues without passing through the operating system or kernel mode. And finally, enabling a quality of service so that multiple applications or multiple processes and threads in a service situation can share the hardware seamlessly. And the HSA Foundation is building out the ecosystem that makes this all possible. So let's look at the HSA Foundation and how far it's come. We announced it just last year, 16 months ago, at the last AMD Developer Summit, June 2012. We were very proud to bring on stage representatives from these five companies, AMD, Arm, MediaTek, Texas Instruments, and Imagination. A great start to a consortium with companies that understood the need to drive low power for heterogeneous processing. In just a year or 16 months, very quickly we added two additional powerful founders, Qualcomm and Samsung. Now combined, we ship billions of processors every year. At the promoter level, we added LG Electronics. And now, among these eight companies, you see the board of directors that does the governance of the HSA Foundation. But in those 16 months, we've quickly filled out the other uh, levels of the foundation, supporters and contributors. And here you see the breadth of support of the foundation. Hardware and software, operating system companies and tools, almost every IP company on the planet, SOC companies, OEMs, everyone is coming to the HSA Foundation. And in the second half of the year, we started an academic program and the universities have signed up. Why? When you're doing university research, you want to do it in an open ecosystem and see the fruits of your research get ultimately deployed across the world. And I'm excited to say that later in this conference, there will be another announcement of another member of the HSA Foundation at the contributor level. Do watch out for that. Very exciting stuff. So you measure a consortium or a foundation by its output. And it has been an amazing first year. In addition to the growth in the membership, the, the foundation set up about the hard work of defining the computer architecture. We set up four working groups on the specification. The HSA programmer's reference manual was published 
by the first working group back in May at a level 0.95. That working group is still working hard on the specification and will bring out a, a 1.0 provisional uh, early in the new year. The HSA system architecture spec will be going for ratification by the end of this year. And the runtime working group and tools working group will publish early next year as well. And we'll be in a position to ship HSA development platforms uh, early next year. This is very important because this is what's gonna allow the application software to start their development. So let's look at the software stack that will enable that development. We start with the HSA system stack. There's a core runtime, a finalizer, a, few, a kernel driver, uh, and, and helper libraries. The interface layer is HSAIL, the HSA intermediate layer. This is the object code format, the target for parallel acceleration. And then on top of that, we put a, a number of programming models. To begin with, there'll be OpenCL, Java, C++ AMP, and Python, with more languages to come. So now I want to look at a few workloads and illustrate why it is that programmers will come to this architecture. And the first one is in the area of video. H.264 has been an extremely popular format for video uh, production and distribution and for streaming on the web. <clears throat> but the web, of course, is challenged with bandwidth congestion. High efficiency video codec, HEVC, H.265, is very much part of the answer here. It's a new generation codec, a new video standard with 30 to 50% better compression. That's important because it can get you to a lower bit rate for the same quality or a much higher quality at the same bit rate. <clears throat> In the comparison image, it may be hard to see on, on this projector, but on, uh, on video screens, you would see much higher definition in the tree uh, as well as in the skier. And of course, as we move from 1080p to 4K and beyond, the benefits become more compelling. They become essential. So this is the next generation encoding standard, and it's computationally complex, but by design, it's easier to parallelize than H.264 was. And cloud video providers need the higher uh, compression to provide the quality of standard as more and more video flows on the internet to higher and higher resolution. So all stages of HEVC are accelerated on the APU. Decryption, decoding, the scaling and picture enhancement, encoding, and encryption. But encode is the heaviest stage. This is the leverage point for compression. It's highly parallel, and algorithms improve monthly. We've seen that with X.264 for H.264, and each time uh, a, a more efficient encoding algorithm is released, the, the, the video streaming providers, the content providers, re-encode their libraries because they need that extra compression. A number of the stages for HEVC may eventually go into fixed function hardware, but I doubt the encoder will, at least in the cloud. And the reason is when it goes into fixed function hardware, it's fixed in terms of algorithm an encode will need to evolve as the compression algorithms get better. It's important to realize the standard standardizes the techniques, the sizes and shapes of the macro blocks, the numbers of angles on which you can track a motion vector. They're not the endpoint in terms of the algorithm that can hunt for those motion vectors to match up to content. That's an area that we enable innovation by providing a very power efficient programmable platform. Let's look at a different kind of workload. This one's in the area of databases. And B plus trees are a special case of B trees. They're a dynamic multi-level index. They're efficient for retrieval of data in the form of key value pairs. And they're used in a lot of popular database management systems like SQLite and CouchDB. So here are some examples <coughs> of important applications in the cloud that today use SQLite and CouchDB, 
and are ripe for acceleration of B plus trees. So how would we accelerate B plus trees? We utilize coarse grain parallelism. We do multiple queries in parallel that increases the utilization of the memory bandwidth and increases total throughput. B plus trees on an HSA enabled APU means we can operate on the data in place even when the database is large. For instance, uh, in the example I'll show you, we use six gigabytes in place and accelerate it on the APU. Accelerating in place eliminates the data copies that have held back GPU acceleration of these databases in the past. So here are the results running on Kaveri. We look at different orders of B plus trees and different applications will use different orders. And the order represents the number uh, of, of key value pairs and pointers uh, in each stage uh, of the index. And you can see that from 8 to 128 in terms of order, we have acceleration in the range of 5.9 to 1.7. And this is running, as I said, on the Kaveri APU, running OpenCL on the HSA software stack. Another interesting example is reverse time migration. This is a supercomputer application. And it's a technique used in the oil and gas industry to search for new oil and natural gas reserves. It's for searching for cavities uh, under the ocean floor, uh, under the land. It's a very memory intensive, highly parallel algorithm. It's a natural scale out algorithm. So if you put APUs into the cloud, you can scale out to 1,000 or 30,000 nodes to run this algorithm. Today, it's often run on 100,000 node CPU systems. Bringing this to HSA enabled APUs will change the game. It will enable current uh, workloads to run faster. It will enable workloads that today take five days to finish in, an, in, a, in a matter of hours. But of course, in an industry like this, when you accelerate and, and change their, their round trip time, they don't sit still. They'll deploy more sensors. They'll get higher resolution and this becomes a competitive advantage in a very competitive field. And the last workload I wanted to look at is text analytics. Of course, this has nothing to do with video. This is another big data example. Here, the dominant algorithm is Hadoop-based TerraSort, and it's a big data search. It's a multi-stage pipeline with multiple processing stages. Traditional GPU has been challenged here because of the need to move data and dealing with the overhead of data copies. An APU with HSA acceleration operates in place. Sort, compression, regular expression parsing, CRC generation, all done in place, allowing the acceleration of these large data search, which then scales out across clusters of APU nodes. Next, I want to look at programming languages. As I mentioned in the diagram earlier, already under development, we have Java, we have OpenMP from SUSE, we have C++ AMP, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to make that multi-platform, and we have Python uh, and the KL extension from Fabric Engine. And on the right, you see the next set of targets, domain-specific uh, languages. Uh, Fortran for supercomputing, JavaScript for the web, open shader language, and R for statistics. HSA enables developers to leverage heterogeneous computing easily and naturally. And it's a three-step process. First of all, we give developers the preferred programming languages that they're already using. Secondly, we enable high-performance, transparent calls to the popular libraries. And third, we enable conventional methods. In other words, we avoid subsetting the language. We allow use of arbitrary data structures, mallocs, function pointers, all of the techniques that programmers have been using for decades. C++ AMP acceleration is about to go multi-platform. 
Two years ago, Herb Sutter of Microsoft announced C++ AMP for the Windows platform at the AMVD Developer Summit. And he said right then that Microsoft was licensing it with the Microsoft Community Promise. We really like this single source model of development, single source file for each function, and it compiles to multiple targets. So much better than having different source for different targets. And we decided to extend it to be multi-platform. Today we're announcing C++ AMP is moving beyond Windows to embrace Linux. We'll offer this acceleration both on our APUs and our discrete GPUs. We're also bringing the Bolt STL library to C++ AMP on both platforms. We'll open source this in 2014, and as you can see from the diagram at the bottom, it comes in through a Clang front end, it uses LLVM as its compiler, and it comes out with a choice of two backends, Spear 1.2 to work across the entire OpenCL ecosystem, and then HSAIL will be a higher performance path to work on HSA APUs. HSA enablement of Java. <clears throat> this is very important, obviously, because of the predominance of Java in server and cloud programming. We talked at previous summits about Java 7 and how we enabled OpenCL application in a library called AppArapi. We also talked last year about how Project Sumatra aims to bring GPU and HSA acceleration into the Java virtual machine in Java 9. And the question was how to bridge that gap. Well, we will provide an HSA-enabled Apper API on Java 8 running off of the Lambda and Stream APIs provided by Oracle and Java, and that will fill this gap <coughs> and, and give you a, 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 a path to acceleration on Java 8 while we wait for the Java virtual machine to take it all the way over the line in Java 9. So to talk more about how this is done and, and the stages um, we went through to get there, I'd like to invite to the stage AMD's Gary Frost. Hey Phil, good to see you. So I happen to know, Gary, that you wrote the original mm -hmm. AppArapi library that um, we open sourced two years ago mm -hmm. to enable Java 7 acceleration, and I know you're heavily involved with the Sumatra Working mm -hmm. Group. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you're getting us from Java 7 to Java 9? Sure, so the, the Java ecosystem is a big e ecosystem. As you said, there are lots and lots of Java developers out there. And of course, we wanted to make sure we captured them. Um, and it was, what was interesting to us is when Java first came out, um, sorry, when, when, when OpenCL and CUDA first came out, there were Java wrappers written around the outside of them for Java developers to be able to take advantage of the compute of the GPU, but from the Java language. But there was a real impedance mismatch in the way in which Java developers had to do this work. So they weren't used to some of the things. So for example, um, with Jockle, which was the OpenCL binding, they had to learn OpenCL as a brand new programming language, a sort of C-based language, and they, they weren't familiar with that. Also, the way in which we moved data between the um, CPU and the GPU, historically with these frameworks, was very weird for Java developers who traditionally don't worry about Java. We have a garbage collector and we don't <laughs> have to worry about that sort of so, thing. So, uh, how many of those problems did your AppArapi implementation deal with? Well, we were very lucky. So the great thing that AppArapi did is it said that you didn't have to learn OpenCL anymore. We actually converted bytecode to, app to OpenCL on the fly underneath, behind the scenes. And we were also able to uh, get away from the problem of buffer transfers by automatically working out which buffer needed to be where at the appropriate time. And that was very, very cool. But we still had some, um, again, we still had these impedance mismatches because Java programmers were just not used to the, some of the things we had to do. For example, we couldn't use objects because of the way in which the Java heap is arranged objects are scattered all over the heap. And to get them to the GPU to do some compute, we kind of had to tear them apart and start to take the data and put them into primitive arrays, and that was kind of horrible. So tell us a little bit about how Java 8 starts to solve that problem. Okay, well, so what I'm gonna do in order to do that is we're gonna sort of look at the N-body problem, which I'm sure you well, have seen. <coughs> You were probably about the 150th person to demonstrate N-body uh, as an illustration of parallel acceleration. So what's different about doing it with Java? Well, so again, as we mentioned earlier, um, if, we <coughs> if we move on, if we look at the, the next slide, we've sort of, we're gonna look at N-body revisited. So this is the problem where we're gonna calculate the position of multiple bodies in 3D space and by checking the gravitational effect each has on the others. 
And what's kind of weird about this is the Java programmer looking at this, sequential to start off with, would probably start off writing a body class object. They would put the state in there and they would have a method which calculated its position relative to all of the others. Standard object-oriented programming. Right, but with Jockle, for example, or, or JCuda, we couldn't do this. We had to take the state okay. out of these devices and put them into primitive arrays. So immediately out of the box, the Java developer is in an alien environment. Mm -hmm. So moving on, the, after they've written this particular uh, object, then they would probably just write a simple loop, in this case sequential, which loops over the bodies. And so, What's really cool is we needed two things, really. We needed a programming model, which allowed us to uh, represent turning serial code into parallel code. And we also needed a mechanism uh, by which we can, <coughs> excuse me, easily handle these objects, to mm -hmm. sort of these objects. And so thankfully, HSA sorts one of the problems out, and the project Lambda, which came out of, uh, out of the Oracle folks, actually solved the other. So let's, let me explain here. So again, we saw our sequential loop yesterday, where we sequential, sorry, yesterday, early on the slide, where we walked through this. On the right-hand side is the new Java 8 stream AP, API for doing the same thing. So on the left-hand side, we loop. On the right-hand side, we create a stream, and then we arrange for the stream to apply a, a Lambda for each iteration. Later on, you can see here, in order to convert from a serial stream to a parallel stream, all we do is add a single parallel keyword to the stream. This is a really cool programming model. We go from a serial version of the code to a parallel version without having to create a bunch of threads, create thread pools, and do stuff. You basically just change three lines of code. We basically change three lines of code. Okay. And so if you move on, what we see here is that the, 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 in Java 8, this parallel stream will be automatically dispatched across all of the CPU cores, and that's really, really cool. So we looked at this. We figured this was a great, great place to inject Sumatra. In Sumatra JVM, the parallel stream will intercept it at the parallel point, but will dispatch the workload across the CPU and the GPU cores. Excellent. So <clears throat> given that you've got a new programming paradigm, <clears throat> how close are you now to getting this all to work? Well, we have an early prototype over here. We have an early prototype of a JVM sitting on brand new hardware, um, sitting on a new HSA stack. Well, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so here's the application here. It's an embody application. We're actually going to um, start it off by restricting execution to a single core. So this is running <coughs> 8,000 bodies on one core of the CPU. Exactly. We are basically, we have a Sumatra JVM, which would normally want to dispatch it to, all the G, to the GPUs, but we're kind of slowing it down and letting it just use one core right. at the moment. So you can see we have 1.67 frames per second. Not very fast. Not too good. So now we're going to actually allow all of the cores to be used. And of course, we have four cores here. So yep. we get a sort of speed up. We've got some overhead in dispatching the work between the threads. And so we get a bit of a, a speed up there by actually allowing the multiple cores to be used. And then if we allow the same code to be turned into HSAIL and dispatched to a HSA-enabled uh, GPU cores, we get to see the frame rate improve again. So we get another factor of improvement over the sequential to multi-core up to um, HSA-enabled devices. And so th this is running through the Java Lambda function and then using the Sumatra code to generate HSAIL and run on HSA. Absolutely. On the APU. And another thing that's, that's kind of interesting here is uh, earlier, of course, we talked about shared virtual memory. What's happening here is we actually have a, a GPU thread which is actually doing the animation and just showing the display. And it's actually looking at the same memory that the, the GPU is actually mutating from the compute point of view. So the Java virtual machine is actually scanning the same memory that the GPU is actually mutating. This is shared virtual memory in action. Well, I'll congratulate you on yet another N-body uh, demo. <laughs> <coughs> but I think this one's special uh, because you just unleashed about 9 million developers into parallel programming. That's cool. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. So in terms of the last word on, on Java from, from this keynote, I want to encourage you all to go to Nandini Romani's uh, keynote tomorrow. She's the Java VP from Oracle, and she'll be presenting on the role of Java in heterogeneous computing, how you can help, and she'll take this subject much, much further. 
So now I want to talk about programming tools. <clears throat> you have your architecture, you've got your programming language, how do you get your program uh, debugged and optimized? Uh, today we're announcing AMD's unified SDK. <clears throat> this gives you access to all of our APU and GPU programmable components in a single unified software developer kit. It has a component installer. It allows you to choose just what you need and install for your particular situation. The initial release includes the APP SDK version 2.9 and Media SDK 1.0 beta. You see a list of uh, features there, and there are deep dive sessions uh, on the technical tracks, uh, both tomorrow and Wednesday, uh, on different apps, uh, as uh, aspects of this SDK uh, I encourage you to attend. We're also announcing AMD's Code Excel 1.3. This is our comprehensive heterogeneous developer tool suite. It includes CPU and GPU profiling, GPU kernel debugging, and GPU kernel analysis. It has a long list of new features in this version. Uh, adding Java support is a big one. Integrated static uh, kernel analysis, remote debugging and profiling, and of course support uh, for all of our latest products. Again, there are deep dive sessions uh, on different pieces of, uh, of code Excel, uh, both tomorrow uh, and Wednesday. And open source libraries <coughs> that we deliver and, and or where we deliver uh, the acceleration. Programming libraries are extremely important for any architecture, uh, and AMD is committed to open and industry standards. So the libraries we put our energy into uh, are open, uh, OpenCV is a great example in terms of uh, a vision library. Uh, Bolt is the C++ template library. Uh, CLMath, uh, and then Apparapi, uh, as Gary just described. Again, deep dive sessions uh, on lots of these different technologies over the next two days. So APUs and HSA have arrived. We have acceleration going from the client to the cloud. It's a convergence at the right time. Parallel workloads are booming. And it's, the key is to provide the acceleration where the data is, whether that's on the client for a snappy user experience or in the cloud for truly scalable services. HSA-enabled APUs in the cloud will accelerate big data analytics, video processing, science, image, genomics will unleash the Java developer community <clears throat> to apply the tools they already have to this acceleration. And we see this acceleration coming at all tiers of the cloud, at traditional data centers, in media hubs, and at the cloud periphery. One of the keys to easing the congestion on the internet is gonna be distributed computing. And we'll see acceleration at all tiers of this distributed cloud. Now at this point, I'd like to introduce a special guest. It's Gary Campbell. He's one of the pioneers of dense servers and cloud computing. He's the infrastructure technology strategy CTO from HP, and he's gonna tell us about his vision for the future of the cloud. Gary? Thanks, Phil. For the last um, couple of years, AMD and HP have been innovating together on something called Moonshot. Moonshot is HP's very, very dense cloud platform. Typically, the Moonshot architecture is about a tenth of the cost, power, cooling, and size of traditional rack-mounted servers. So there's tremendous economics to using Moonshot in the cloud. Today, what we're announcing is an AMD HP cartridge. They're pretty small, as you can see. And this one is for the hosted desktop workloads. It has four low-powered Opgron X2150 APUs. Each one's dedicated to a single desktop. So the desktop gets its own four cores and its own dedicated GPU, unlike uh, VDI market. Oops, 
Can you go back a slide, please? To the second slide. The hosted desktop markets is a very, very big market. It's multi-billion dollars, it's growing fast. And what we found is when we dedicated a core to a desktop with the, the dedicated GPU, I mean dedicated an APU to the desktop with the dedicated GPUs, we just got simply a much better predictable performance to the end user for both the performance of their applications and the performance of their graphics. But the economics of Moonshot makes that less expensive than a traditional VDI environment. What we found is when we compared 180 desktops on a Moonshot uh, platform to 180 very small form factor uh, traditional desktops, the Moonshot H AMD HP solution could be deployed in 90% less time. The graphics were six times faster. The total cost of ownership was 44% less, and you saved 12% on power. So this is a very innovative solution for the hosted desktop workloads. HP's got a Pathfinder program for building out the Moonshot ecosystem. It consists of partners like AMD, which are, tw and there's 25 of the best of the best silicon and software providers in the Pathfinder program. The Pathfinder program works with HP to innovate on new solutions like this one. And it has four big discovery labs around the world where Pathfinder members can go and physically access Moonshot platforms to innovate with their solutions or to test on Moonshot or they can remotely access these systems. Since this is a developer conference, I want to invite you, if you're interested in innovating with AMD and HP on Moonshot, go and find the HP booth on the floor and ask them, ask them about becoming a Pathfinder member. And with that, I'll turn it back to Phil. So thank you, Gary. I mean, AMD, we're very <coughs> uh, proud to be a part of the Moonshot program and a partner to you. And I, I noticed you, you mentioned that uh, we're doing uh, accelerated uh, desktops here. Uh, do you have in mind additional workloads that you see bringing to market um, in future versions of the Moonshot program? Uh, we do. The, the host of desktops just what we're starting with, but with the, the graphics capabilities and the Optron X, I think it's ideal for being in um, mobile phone networks with the carriers for video streaming, video transcoding. And we also see it applying with the, you know, all, all the work you're doing on HSA to high performance computing. Well, I think we, uh, we see the future in a very similar vein. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, we close out this keynote, and I'd like to invite back to the stage uh, John Taylor.